the Honorable, the Chief Justice, and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oyez, oyez, oyez. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this honorable court. Welcome to America and the Courts, C-SPAN's weekly look at the federal judiciary. This weekend on America and the Courts, former Supreme Court law clerk John Roberts talks to high school teachers about how the court works and its decision-making process. He's a Washington, D.C. attorney who's argued 24 cases before the high court. The teachers were recently in Washington for an intensive one-week seminar on the Supreme Court, hosted by the Supreme Court Historical Society and the National Institute for Citizen Education in the Law. Here's a 55-minute portion of John Roberts' talk, which follows this brief introduction. Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the third annual Supreme Court Summer Institute for High School Teachers. The purpose of this institute is to provide you with information, material, and teaching strategies to enable you to strengthen instruction about the Supreme Court, constitutional law, and constitutional history. The institute is conducted by the staff of the National Institute for Citizen Education in the Law, also known as NICL, soon to be known as Street Law, Inc., as we change our name on July 1st, in cooperation with Georgetown University Law Center. The program is supported by the Supreme Court Historical Society, and funding for the program has been received from the Park Foundation, United Parcel Service Foundation, and State Farm Companies Foundation. We certainly appreciate their support. Our opening session focuses on U.S. Supreme Court practice, and in particular on two important decisions that the court makes, the decision to hear a case and the actual decision in the case. To help us better understand the court's operation, we have a uniquely qualified person, John Roberts, graduate of the Harvard Law School, has clerked for Judge Friendly of the U.S. Court of Appeals, Third Circuit, uh, before clerking for then Associate Justice William Rehnquist. After these clerkships, John moved over to the White House, working uh, in the counsel's office for President Reagan, and then moving to the Solicitor General's office in the Department of Justice, where he argued cases before the Supreme Court representing the United States. After leaving government service, he continued his Supreme Court practice at Hogan and Hartson, a Washington, D.C. law firm, where he continues to practice and argue before the Supreme Court. This term he argued an important case about class action settlements. John has been a regular presenter at this institute and has received rave reviews for his fascinating, informative, and entertaining presentations about the Supreme Court. And uh, for the first half of the session, John will focus on the court's operation, and then he'll answer questions from the audience. John, we very much appreciate your being with us again. Thanks so much. Let's welcome John Roberts. Uh, thank you very much, Lee. Um, Lee has seen me do this before, and so I know he expects me to begin by telling a few uh, lawyer jokes, but I've, uh, I've stopped doing that. I found that uh, uh, lawyers in the audience didn't think they were funny, and the uh, non-lawyers didn't think they were jokes. Um, <laughs> As he mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, the two important decisions the justices make, uh, which cases to decide and how to decide those cases. Uh, but before I do that, I thought it would be useful to review the uh, personnel involved. Um, the justices are, by and large, a very anonymous bunch. Um, they prefer it that way. Um, they work in uh, anonymity, uh, and I'm very sort of have a non-pretentious view of their very important labors. That goes back throughout history. When the uh, new Supreme Court building was opened um, in the early 30s, one of the justices complained that it was too grandiose and said, you know, what do they expect us to do, ride in on elephants or something? Um, they had a much more modest view of their role, and that continues today. Um, but uh, it is important to understand who the individuals are because they act individually in coming together to form a majority in any particular case. Looking at the bench from the advocate's uh, position at the podium on the far left is Justice Ginsburg. Uh, for some reason she is almost routinely confused with Justice O'Connor. 
no less a personage than the Solicitor General of the United States this year has twice referred to her as Justice O'Connor. Uh, Professor Tribe from Harvard, a distinguished advocate, has done it. Uh, I can't figure out why they do it. They don't uh, look at all alike, but uh, uh, she takes great pleasure in the mistake whenever it's made. Uh, moving to the right next to her is Justice Souter. Uh, the court and the uh, bar of the court, I think, has by now adjusted to Justice Souter's uh, distinctive New England accent. Uh, there was a wonderful story, I guess it was last year, where uh, he asked a, a lawyer arguing before the court uh, in what respect the argument was flawed. And the, the lawyer was completely confused and he said, floored, floored, and he said, no, flawed, and he kept trying to get out flawed instead of floored. Uh, but the lawyer was completely, uh, completely confused by the exchange. Um, again, moving to the right, uh, uh, next in line is Justice Scalia. Uh, Justice Scalia is one of the more active questioners on the bench. Uh, if you argue there, uh, you can expect your neck to be tilted this way most of the time answering, uh, answering his questions. Uh, Justice Stevens is next to Justice Scalia, moving uh, again to the right. Uh, a distinctive member of the court in many respects. Uh, starting with fashion. He's the only one who regularly wears a bow tie rather than a, uh, a, a, a one of these ties. Um, he is the only justice who's not a member of the cert pool, something we'll talk about in, in a little bit. In the middle, of course, is the Chief Justice. In something of an unusual situation historically, he is the most senior justice by virtue of his uh, position as Chief Justice, but also most senior, uh, the longest serving of uh, all the justices. Um, next to the Chief Justice, Justice O'Connor. Uh, if you're interested in making some spare change uh, during the court's year, you can uh, bet people that she will ask the first question in a case. Uh, she almost always does. Uh, it's a question that goes to the heart of the case. She wants to get it out right away before the uh, questioning gets out of control. Uh, and and uh, no matter what the issue, she almost always will ask the first question. Uh, Moving again to the right, uh, Justice Kennedy is next to Justice O'Connor, uh, one of the important uh, middle swing justices, uh, swing votes on the, on the court. Uh, again to the right, Justice Thomas, uh, one of the less frequent questioners on the bench. Uh, all courts have, uh, have had justices who preferred to listen to the lawyers, which we lawyers always appreciate, uh, rather than ask questions. Uh, justice Brennan, for example, was a very infrequent questioner. Uh, justice Powell, a very infrequent questioner. Uh, and then on the far right, as you face the bench, uh, the newest appointee, Justice uh, Breyer, uh, still very much the law professor on the bench. Um, uh, his questions uh, often are really a mini lecture about his views on the case to which the lawyer is expected to respond. Um, I was in the court the, uh, the day that Justice Breyer announced his first opinion uh, on the bench, which is a significant day in a justice's tenure on the court, and it taught a very valuable lesson about the court. Um, uh, you may remember his confirmation hearings, like most of the recent ones, focused on sort of the uh, hot button social issues of the day, uh, affirmative action, abortion, the death penalty, things like that, uh, issues that the senators and the public were concerned about. His first decision was about the validity of uh, an arbitration clause in a termite inspection contract <laughs> in Alabama. Uh, but he gave it the full treatment, uh, explaining for uh, all the tourists gathered in the court exactly what the issue was and why the court decided it um, the, way, the way it did. Uh, okay, how does the court decide which cases to take? Uh, it's called, in shorthand jargon, the cert process, because you start it by filing a petition for writ of certiorari. Uh, it looks like this. It uh, has to have a white cover. And the court's rules are very specific about one thing. On the first page, the very first page, they want the question you want the court to decide and nothing else. So when you open it up, they can see exactly what it is uh, you want them to decide. 7,700, somewhere around there, of these cert petitions get filed every year. Uh, the court this year, I think, will end up hearing about 85 cases. Uh, very high odds uh, in trying to get the court to take your case. Uh, how do they decide 
uh, which case to take. They don't try to find the 85 most important cases. That's a factor that they take into consideration, uh, but it's not the leading factor. Uh, this year of the 85 cases, if you stretch, maybe 10 of them would be cases that you would read about in the paper uh, on the first page. The vast majority of the cases uh, involve issues uh, that are of great interest to the parties, uh, to other lawyers practicing in the area, but probably not of great interest to everyday Americans as they go about their business. Um, so it's not how important the case is. Uh, it's not even how wrong the case was when it was decided below. Uh, they don't care if it was decided wrongly. It's a famous story of Justice Holmes when he was getting out of a carriage and going up to the court to do his work. And the person yelled out after him, uh, do justice. And he uh, was quite angry and turned around and said, that's not my job. And it very much is not the job of the Supreme Court. It's not, in technical terms, a court of error. Uh, uh, in fact, it seems paradoxical, but if your case was really wrongly decided, uh, a clear miscarriage of justice, the Supreme Court's very unlikely to take it because it'll be recognized as such and won't be followed by other courts. So it's not how important the case is. It's not how wrongly it was decided. The key factor that the court looks for in deciding whether to take a case is whether it conflicts with other decisions on the same question. If the federal court that covers New York and the Northeast has decided a question one way and the federal court that covers California and the West has decided that same question a different way, that's the sort of case that might make it from the 7,500 petitions into the 85 cases the court will hear. Their major role is ensuring the uniformity of federal law uh, and resolving conflicts either among the federal circuit courts or among the state supreme courts. Once one of these is filed, starting the process, the other side, the side that won below, that doesn't want the Supreme Court to disturb its case, uh, files a brief in opposition to certiorari. It has to have an orange color. It's one of the great things about practice in the Supreme Court, everything has its own color, as you'll see, and they've almost run out of colors. They've gotten to the different, uh, to the point where they distinguish between dark green and pastel green, but it certainly makes it easier to know what you're grabbing when you grab one of the briefs out of the stack. An orange brief, a brief in opposition. It tries to explain uh, why there isn't what might appear to be a conflict among the circuits. It might just say that this, the most that the uh, petitioner is arguing is that this case was wrongly decided and that's not a sufficient reason uh, to grant cert. Uh, the petitioner gets a short, less than 10-page reply brief. It has to be tan, um, in which he tries to respond to those arguments by the respondent, the person opposing cert. Uh, and then what? The justices sit down uh, with these 7,500 sets of white, orange, and tan briefs and read them. Uh, no, they don't. Uh, they have law clerks who perform a very valuable function in screening the cases and summarizing the petitions for the justices. Eight of the justices are in what's known as the cert pool, the certiorari pool, which means that one law clerk from among those eight justices will write a memo about each certiorari petition, say what the uh, arguments are, uh, whether they think cert should be granted, the arguments against cert, and that's what the justices will review in most cases. From time to time, they may refer back to the uh, original briefs if they think they need a little bit more information. But with 7,500 cases to go through, you can imagine that most of the time they're relying on that memo. Again, Justice Stevens uh, reviews the cert petitions uh, in his own way with his clerks, doesn't participate in the cert pool. Once a week, a list goes around of all the cases that are going to be discussed that week, and the uh, Chief Justice circulates what's known as the discuss list has on the list of the however many cert petitions are up that week, and it's 7,500 divided by 52, for anyone whose math is better than mine. Uh, he says, these are the dozen I think we should talk about. They look like likely candidates. Any of the other justices can add additional candidates to that list, and then they talk about it at conference. Uh, at, con at cert conferences, the rule of four applies. You need four votes uh, to get cert granted. Uh, uh, so uh, you don't necessarily go in with a majority thinking you're right. And of those four, they may not think the decision is wrong. It's, it's not at all uncommon to think that this decision was correctly decided, but because it conflicts with some other decision, we need to resolve that conflict. 
uh, four votes, and the uh, order will appear on the next order list as, uh, as cert, cert granted. Then uh, the process shifts to the merits. Uh, the petitioner has to file his brief first. It's like this. It's blue under the rules. Uh, and the arguments are often very different from those in the white brief the petitioner filed some months before. In the white brief, remember, all the petitioner is trying to do is say, this is an issue on which the courts are in disagreement. It's important that there be a uniform answer. You should give us the uniform answer. The blue brief, they've already taken the case. Now the petitioner argues, this is the right answer. The court below was wrong. Here's why I'm right. Uh, the respondent, again, of course, gets his chance to argue the merits. The red brief, uh, again, focus not on whether or not the case is an important one, whether a conflict should be resolved, but whether uh, the court below was right uh, or wrong. The petitioner gets a reply brief, yellow, um, but also a, a vast number of other briefs are filed, known as amicus briefs, friends of the court, organizations that will have an interest in the uh, issue before the court, but not be parties to it. If it's a labor dispute, you can expect the AFL-CIO to file an amicus brief. Uh, uh, if it's a criminal case, perhaps the uh, Public Defenders Association will file it. An environmental case, you'll hear from the Sierra Club, uh, that sort of thing. To distinguish, if you're supporting the petitioner, it's pale green. If you're supporting the respondent, it's dark green. Uh, this is an area where the federal government plays an important role. Uh, One-third of those 85 cases, roughly, are going to be the cases brought by the United States itself, cases where the government lost and wants the court to resolve a conflict that it sees. In another one-half of the remaining two-thirds, another third, the federal government will file an amicus brief uh, saying the United States has an interest in this dispute between two private parties or between a state and a private party. The United States is typically the only amicus that the court will allow to argue. Uh, normally, the argument is one half hour for the petitioner, a half hour for the respondent. Uh, but if the United States is on your side, it, it, it will also get, typically, uh, some argument time, 10 minutes of your, your time. Uh, so a representative of the Solicitor General will present the United States' position on that case. Uh, with rare historical exceptions, no other amicus group uh, is, is, given, is given argument time. Now, the argument um, is, is one of the most exciting spectacles uh, in Washington. Uh, it is not by any stretch of the imagination a speech by two lawyers uh, to a group of attentive justices listening carefully and taking notes. Uh, the justices speak during an argument uh, to a far greater extent than the single lawyer. Uh, it's a question and answer session. Uh, the number of questions can be truly astounding. I went back and looked at the transcript of an argument I did a couple years ago, and I found I had been asked uh, over 150 questions in the half hour. Um, uh, they can be rapid fire questions from someone like Justice Scalia. Uh, they can be long and involved questions with the uh, predicates and subordinate clauses from a Justice Souter uh, or a Justice Breyer. Uh, they can be friendly questions trying to help you out. Uh, they can be extremely hostile. Uh, the process is designed uh, to allow the justices to focus on what they think is most important. That's why as a lawyer practicing before the court, you welcome the questions. Um, it is also a time, though, for the justices to tell their colleagues what they think about the case. This will be the only time that all nine of them are really focused on this one case. Um, and if they think there are problems in a particular position, they'll want to draw those out so that Justice so-and-so down the bench will understand that there are problems. Uh, if they think there are important points, they'll want to make sure those are made uh, so that the other justices will appreciate it and come around to the position that they're bringing to the argument. So the lawyer is often like a spectator at a, at a tennis match. Uh, Justice Scalia asking a question, uh, you know, counsel, uh, uh, it doesn't appear that we have jurisdiction under Section 1331. And before you can answer, Justice O'Connor coming in saying, well, in any event, isn't there jurisdiction under the other provision allowing for diversity of citizenship? And before you can answer that, Justice Scalia coming in again saying, well, but that diversity jurisdiction wasn't pled in this case, was it? And then Justice O'Connor coming back and saying, well, isn't it true that, and you're just sort of looking back and forth <laughs> while they're making their respective uh, points, struggling to get uh, 
a word in, in, a word in edgewise. Um, after the argument, uh, the case goes to conference. If the case was argued on a Monday, it'll go to the, be, be discussed by the justices at their Wednesday afternoon conference. Tuesday and Wednesday cases I uh, discussed at the Friday conference. Uh, the discussion begins with the Chief Justice, who will say, this is the case we heard argument in. It's about such and such. Uh, here are the arguments. Uh, this is what I think and uh, uh, indicate how he will be voting. Then go to the next senior justice and so on down the line. The uh, junior justices have often complained uh, about this process because they generally don't get to speak until the very end. And if at that point the vote is seven to one, six to two, uh, nobody really is terribly interested in what they have to say since their vote isn't going to, isn't going to count. The consolation for that, of course, are those a uh, few and extraordinary cases when it comes to them and the vote is four to four. Uh, then everyone is on the edge of their seat waiting to see which way they'll go because it will dictate uh, the way the case will go. Uh, once the vote is in, um, uh, later that day, the opinions are assigned. Uh, if the Chief Justice is in the majority, uh, he has the prerogative of assigning the opinion. Uh, if not, the most senior of the Associate Justices uh, has that responsibility. Um, uh, this uh, sitting Chief Justice uh, makes, I think, a very uh, serious effort to distribute the work evenly. Uh, you know, there are glamorous and exciting cases before the court, and there are other cases that the clerks call the dogs that are not terribly interesting, that are the bulk of the court's work. I think the Chief tries to make sure that the justices have an even distribution of uh, good and interesting cases and dogs, um, and spreads the work around uh, that way. The opinion process, there's nothing terribly uh, involved about it. If you're assigned the opinion, you write out a draft. It's, it's printed up by the print shop, so it looks a little better than the first drafts of things we send around the office. Um, and then the uh, protocol is, uh, if you want to sign on to an opinion that's circulated, uh, for historical reasons, you're, you ask the author to join you. Uh, you know, dear uh, chief, uh, with respect to your opinion in Smith versus Jones, please join me. That means uh, that justice is voting with that opinion. Uh, sometimes they'll suggest changes, saying I could see my way to join your opinion in this case, but I disagree with this particular paragraph or the point you make in this footnote, and uh, if you could take that out, then I would feel free to join. Uh, as you can imagine, it's a little bit of a, a negotiation process. Um, if it's a tight vote, uh, suggestions to take this uh, this uh, paragraph out and add a site to this or whatever are are, are uh, greeted with uh, a spirit of cooperation. Uh, if the justice is sitting there and he's already got his or her five votes, you know the suggestion that please change this comma to a semicolon is probably the heck with it. We don't need you at that point. So um, uh, meanwhile, uh, if someone's writing a dissent, uh, that'll be circulated shortly thereafter. Um, and, and uh, people will vote to join that. Occasionally, what uh, looked to be a majority, say 5-4 one way, turns out uh, when the justices see the writing to come out a different way. Uh, it happens, and then the dissent is changed into the majority opinion. Justices with particular views that they want expressed in a case can write a concurring opinion as well, saying they agree with this result, but they have a different uh, process for getting, uh, getting to it. Once all the votes are in and all the editing is done, the opinion's ready for publication, um, and it's announced from the bench. A uh, process I understand you'll see next uh, Monday when you go to see the court announce decisions. Uh, the justices usually don't read the whole opinion, but give a short summary of it so the people in the audience understand what the case was about and what's, uh, what's being decided. Uh, and then the copies of the opinion are released uh, to the public, and it becomes uh, the law of the land. Um, the court has uh, a goodly number of very significant opinions uh, yet to come out this year. Uh, the court usually rises for the summer at the end of June, uh, early July, so they're running out of time, so they're going to be issuing these important opinions very soon. Um, and as soon as they release the, uh, uh, the last of them, uh, the court will uh, adjourn uh, for the summer. The Constitution will be safe for the summer, as we <laughs> like to put it, uh, until they return again the first Monday in October in the fall and begin the process uh, all over again. 
Uh, that's a very brief overview of how they decide uh, which cases to hear every year uh, and how they go about deciding them. Um, and I'd be happy to entertain uh, questions on that or uh, any other part of the court's process. Yes? I've always been um, surprised at how big a role the clerks play in this process. They're fairly young people. They don't have a lot of experience with the law, and yet they um, uh, are, are heavily involved, like you say, with the cert pool and with other advice to the justices. Do you think that's wise to give so much power to people that have so little experience? Do, has it ever been suggested, for example, to have more professional older people play that role? I think it's a mistake. Um, if you ask the law clerks, they would agree with you that they have a great deal of power and influence. Um, but I think it's a mistake. Uh, with one exception that I'll talk about, uh, they generally don't. Uh, I mean, think of the justices who are sitting on the court uh, today. Um, uh, a young law student, uh, one year out of law school, as most of the clerks are. They spend, usually spend a year clerking for a judge in the Court of Appeals and then go to the Supreme Court for a year is not going to uh, persuade uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist or Justice O'Connor or Justice Scalia that they should change their view about the Establishment Clause or about the Commerce Clause. Um, the justices, I think, uh, like having clerks. They, they get some valuable feedback from them. Uh, they can perform some valuable services in researching particular uh, issues, sometimes drafting opinions, sometimes editing opinions, just discussing it, uh, discussing the case. But the, the notion that they play a significant role in how the d cases are decided, I, I think, is quite wrong. Uh, uh, they, they don't. Where they do play a role that I think may be becoming a bit too uh, significant is in the cert process. As the number of cert petitions has grown dramatically and, and as the number of cases heard has shrunk. 15, 20 years ago the court was hearing about 150, 160 cases out of 4,000, 5,000 cert petitions. Now they're hearing 85 out of 7,500. The process of deciding which of those cases is heard is, is terribly important. Um, and with eight of the justices in the cert pool, you're really, the, the job of that one law clerk writing the cert pool memo uh, can be very important. Um, that, I think, is a little disquieting. I think wh when I was clerking back in 1980, 81, we, there were only five justices in the cert pool. So you had some confidence if the clerk misses something, one of the other four justices will catch that case. Now there's only one who's not in the pool, and, and, and you don't really have that confidence. So, I mean, I don't have any particular proposal to fix it. Uh, you certainly don't want the justices spending a lot of time wading through thousands and thousands of petitions to pick the 85. They need to spend their time deciding the cases that they are going to hear. But it, it may not be an ideal process uh, from the point of view. Maybe they ought to have two parallel pools or something like that so you get some backstopping uh, involved. Yes. I have a two-part question. How is it determined which justice at this point does not sit on the cert pool, and does that justice then get to vote on the cases to be heard? Oh, sure. It, it's entirely up to the justices uh, whether they want to do it this way. Justice Stevens just never has. Uh, I don't know if it's his uh, uh, individualist nature coming out, uh, uh, just like the causes him to wear a bow tie rather than the others, but he's always, you know, found that he can look at, flip through the cert petitions with the aid of, aid of his clerks and decide what he wants to look at and what not. The other justices just have always, as I said, when I was there it was five, and as new ones came on, they just sort of joined up. Um, uh, so it's not as if one's assigned outside of it. It's, it's entirely up to the justices themselves. Yes. Um, I was interested in your comment that it's not a place to do justice. Um, do you think that all the members of the court would agree with that? I think they would agree with it uh, to the extent on the question of which cases to hear. Um, uh, of the, whatever it is, 7,415 cases they don't hear every year, 
I don't think any of the justices would tell you it's because they think all of those cases were correctly decided or that every one of the cases they don't want here, uh, they're satisfied that there's been no miscarriage of justice. It is not a court of error. Uh, their job, as they, I think, to a person see it, is to uh, correctly interpret the Constitution, to resolve conflicts in federal law and, and with state Supreme Courts, but not to uh, correct mistakes in individual cases. If you come up through the federal system, you have a federal district court and then a federal court of appeals, the possibility of en banc review at the Federal Court of Appeals. And if the mistake has persisted through that, I think the general view is well, uh, any human system is going to have uh, mistakes and we can't ensure perfection. And if they spent their time <coughs> correcting every case that they thought was wrongly decided, they wouldn't have time uh, to devote the attention to resolving uh, the conflicts and settling the constitutional disputes uh, that they need to devote. So I, I think they, uh, yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, they would like all the cases to come out correctly, but I think they appreciate that it's just beyond the capability of nine people reviewing 7,500 cases and would detract from uh, what are more important institutional missions that they have. Yes? Mr. Roberts, um, I was intrigued by something I read about the importance of politics versus principle in the deliberations of the court. I just wondered if... And I know a lot of subjectivity comes into this as you look at how a court operates, but could you comment uh, from your pers perspective on what part politics plays in the decision-making process of the court versus doing what's right or what uh, well, should be done according to principle? Uh, politics covers many, uh, many sins. I mean, certainly in, in sort of the uh, lowest denominator of uh, partisan politics, Democrats, Republicans, uh, I think it plays no, pro uh, no role in the process whatsoever. The, the framers of the Constitution gave justices life tenure and protection in their salary and, and, uh, uh, and tenure in office to ensure that they wouldn't be swayed by those things. And, and, uh, and by and large, I think they, they're not. Um, the, the instances where justices turn out uh, not to reflect the political values of presidents who appointed them are legion throughout the court's history. A uh, conservative president appointing the Earl Warren, one of the most liberal chief justices, and a, a liberal appointing uh, a, 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 a Felix Frankfurter, for example, who became quite a bit more conservative than uh, than what was expected. So politics in that sense I don't think plays any role. Ju the justices do come to the court with different judicial philosophies, uh, different views of what's appropriate for a judge or a justice, different uh, theories of the Constitution. Um, and those certainly stay with them, are affected, uh, are sometimes changed. Uh, uh, but that's not, uh, not politics in, in, in sort of a partisan sense. Yes? When you argue before the Supreme Court, do you prepare 30 minutes of text? And how do you get those points across that you want to hit if you're being bombarded by questioning throughout that 30 minutes? I, I prepare for a 30-minute argument. I prepare to speak for two minutes. Um, <laughs> and, and frankly, almost never get uh, those two minutes out. Two minutes is a long time with these nine individuals. The, the thought that they'll let listen to you for that long when they've got a burning question that they know is important to how they're going to decide the case, uh, it's just not going to happen. And I don't want it to happen. I want to know that this is the issue that Justice O'Connor thinks is important because hopefully through preparation I'll have an answer that'll help uh, persuade her. If they're just sitting there listening to you drone on and on, you've lost them. Um, and it's often not because they think you're right. Uh, so you, you, you want questions. What you do is, is uh, your preparation should reflect the process. I prepare answers to expected questions. I get people who've worked on the case and who've read the briefs to come up with as many questions as they can and go through an actual process. Have them sit down, pretend you're just as so-and-so, ask me questions. Um, and you get ready with answers. And you get ready with answers that are not, uh, you know, I have a five-part response to that question because you're only going to get the first part out before another justice jumps in with another question. Get your point across as concisely and quickly as you can and work on sort of taking their questions, figuring out where they're concerned and interested and move the argument in a way that helps, hopefully helps your client's, uh, client's case. Uh, but a 30-minute 
speech is uh, the worst possible preparation because you won't get it out and if you're not prepared to answer the questions it'll be a long 30 minutes yes I'm just curious. Um, you clerked under um, Rehnquist when he was Associate Justice. Do you feel that he has changed since he is Associate Justice to now becoming Chief Justice, or he has been consistent with his views? Oh, God, uh, that's hard to answer. I mean, you'd have to analyze a whole range of different legal issues. Um, uh, I think he has uh, a carefully considered view of the Constitution and the role of the court in American life, and I don't think uh, that that has changed. Um, institutionally, I think it's a big change when you, you go from associate justice to being the chief justice. Um, I think he tended to ask a lot more questions when he was an associate justice, and now tends to have to spend some time policing the other uh, uh, eight as, as they're all stepping on each other's questions and not allowing the lawyers to answer and uh, devotes a little bit more time to that. So institutionally, it's a very different role being uh, Chief Justice than Associate Justice, but jurisprudentially, I think his views have been uh, uh, consistent and, and, and based on a uh, carefully thought out and consistent view of the Constitution. Yes. Uh, within the court, how are dissents viewed? I mean, historically, you've had people who've voted in the minority but never really expressed it. Um, there have been certain cases, Brown probably being the most famous, in which the Chief Justice worked real hard to make sure you had unanimity. Is there any kind of feeling within the court that a dissent upsets things and some of them are more pointed than others in terms of the way they review the majority? Yeah, you know, I think it depends on the nature of the case. Uh, the nine individuals are all extremely strong-willed and they come to firmly held views in particular cases. In cases that you would think it's very difficult to get terribly excited about because most of them are not these ten important cases. Um, and they'll express them. Uh, there are cases, Justice Brandeis put it once, where he said in, in, this, er in, in this area uh, it's more important that the question be decided than that it be decided correctly. Uh, in other words, what we need is a rule that everybody can understand. So if the majority of the court is going to say, this is our rule, if it's one of those types of cases, perhaps the people who think the other way will think, well, it's not terribly important that the other rule apply. In other areas, that's different. Uh, where an issue is going to keep coming up and they have strong views, they'll want to uh, express them. Um, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, if you read dissents and majority opinions, you would think there's a lot of uh, s snappiness and bitterness between the justices, and I, I, I don't think that's the case. Um, they, they have strong views. Uh, it's incumbent upon them to express them in appropriate cases, and they do. And they know that in the next case, somebody else will be dissenting from one of their opinions. Um, but it's, it's part of the job. I think they recognize that and, and uh, do it and move on to the next case. Yes. Can you ignore your argument before the Supreme Court justices? Uh, well, you, you technically have to be a member of the Supreme Court bar, uh, but that's not as hard to, to be as you might think. Uh, you basically have to be a member of any bar for three years and not have been convicted of a felony or something like that. And a surprising number of lawyers qualify under those standards. Um, <laughs> Uh, so pretty much yes, uh, any lawyer can argue before the Supreme Court and some lawyers who don't do it on a regular basis uh, uh, but you know will do it maybe once in their life do an extremely good job of it um, uh, if they take the time to learn how the court is different than other courts they've appeared before and, and, and what they have to do to prepare. Yes? Um, I want to take you back to when you were in high school um, when you were in high school, what was your concept of the Supreme Court um, and how did that change over time with your various experiences? And then if there was one thing that you could tell every high school student about the Supreme Court from your vast experience, what would it be? Well, I, I think I had a, a, a very different view of the Supreme Court. You know, it's the sort of thing you, uh, whenever you get into any dispute and feel strongly about it and it's a legal one, you'd say you're going to take it all the way to the Supreme Court. <laughs> And, you know, that's your right as an American citizen. Um, uh, and I thought the Supreme Court spent most of its time worrying about things like the First Amendment and the death penalty and things like that. Well, you can say you're going to take a case all the way to the Supreme Court, and you, can, you certainly get to file one of these, <laughs> but you probably won't get to file one of these. Uh, and that's an important uh, change. And it's, it's, it is true. 
obviously in the important areas of the First Amendment and such, the court occupies a critical role in articulating the constitutional values. And, you know, maybe that's what high school students should understand and learn. But as they go on, if they go into the area, they'll learn that the court spends most of its time dealing with technical tax cases, bankruptcy cases. Uh, today the court released uh, an original action, a dispute between the state of Alaska and the United States over what lands constituted part of the state and what were subject to federal jurisdiction. Uh, the example I had with Justice Breyer is, I think, a very good one. Yes, it's important to find out uh, for people uh, considering conference what are his views on the First Amendment, what are his views on school prayer. Uh, but his first case is going to be about the validity of an uh, arbitration clause in a termite inspection contract out of Alabama. Uh, that's why the, today's court is, is in many respects different from others throughout history. Eight of the justices came to the court from uh, other benches. They were judges on the courts of appeals or in the state courts. Only, only the chief justice uh, was not a judge before going to the, the bench. It is a more judge-like court. You don't have uh, former statesmen or senators or, or uh, governors as you often did in the courts past. They're judges uh, and they spend most of their time judging. Yes. You mentioned that uh, most of the issues come when there's conflict, conflicting opinions from the different circuits. Are there some circuits that are more apt to disagree with one another than yes. others? Yes. Um, uh, a variety of reasons, uh, and different circuits sort of have a better reputation in some areas of the law than others. Uh, for example, uh, if you have a mining case, it's more important really what the Tenth Circuit in the Rocky Mountains thinks about that issue than what the First Circuit up in New England is likely to think about it. Um, for a lot of reasons, and we can speculate about what they are, uh, the Ninth Circuit, uh, California and the, the, the Western chunk of the United States uh, doesn't have a very good track record in recent years at the Supreme Court. They tend to get a higher proportion of their cases granted. They tend to get a higher proportion of those cases that are granted uh, reversed. Um, uh, who knows why that is, but it, uh, it, does, it, it certainly is not uh, random. Uh, there's a statistically significant uh, difference there. Yes? Um, back when Warren Burger was Chief Justice, there was a lot of talk about the Supreme Court being overworked and there was some discussion of a possible intermediate court of appeals and as you said they were hearing about 150 cases a year. Now they're down to about 80 and it seems as though that talk has dissipated. Is the court kind of taking care of itself or is that issue just not? It's, it's kind of hard to, to, to figure out. I, it may be that the, I, I know, I think a number of the justices were in favor of the idea. In other words, you have an intermediate national court of appeals that would resolve this dispute about what the bankruptcy code means in this narrow category of cases and leave for the uh, real Supreme Court the important constitutional issues. It, you know, it may be that they've decided to implement that proposal unilaterally and they're only going to take 85 and they're not going to have a chance to resolve a lot of cases and if people think they should be, well then uh, give them this uh, intermediate court of appeals. I was uh, at the time not in favor of that. I, I think it's important that the Supreme Court uh, remain a court, that it, uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, have to decide particular cases, have to decide whether this arbitration clause and the termite inspection contract is valid. Don't forget what it's like to be a judge and apply particular laws. I, I think we would lose something if they just spent their time thinking, you know, now what does the First Amendment mean? What does search and seizure uh, cover? What does the Commerce Clause mean? They should be good judges and good lawyers first, and I think we get that when we force them to be the only place that can decide uh, all these issues and resolve the conflicts. Yes? Do you think that's one reason the number of cases they've accepted has gone down so much, so I'm 150 to 75 this year? I, you know, we, we speculate, particularly those of us who try to make a living arguing the cases, speculate uh, sometimes uh, uh, w with some anxiety as to why the number of cases is going down. Um, I think it may be because of the turnover on the court. Uh, the court is fairly evenly divided. You don't have a dominant wing 
uh, that can feel confident its views will be accepted in every case. It's evenly decided, and when a new kid comes into the uh, neighborhood, uh, you don't know what he or she thinks about these important issues. So you may be a little less willing to say, let's take that important Fourth Amendment case, because maybe it'll come out the wrong way. Um, there's been a lot of turnover uh, in recent years, and I think it takes may take a while for the new justices to settle in and feel comfortable saying, I want to take this case, and the other justices to get a sense of what the new people think to feel comfortable saying, this is a good case to take. But that that's idle speculation. I mean, uh, I know when they were deciding 150, 160 a year, that, that was probably too much uh, to do a good job. This time of year, you'd get there and they'd have you know, dozens and dozens of cases left to go, and they, they felt the rush to get them out, and the quality of the opinions was probably not what it should be. Um, now that they're only taking 85 cases uh, this time of year, you have dozens and dozens still to come out, and the quality has, I mean, the, the work tends to fill up the available time, so uh, uh, I think they can probably do a few more than 85, but not as many as 160. Yes? Oh, uh, just a, a couple of questions. Is, is there any time, like, when the judges get, like, just silly? I mean, do they, like, try to break the ice? And my second question is, uh, would there ever be another opportunity for a person like a Gideon to not have the amount of money to, uh, to hire a lawyer or whatever to submit something on a napkin or a piece of scrap paper and say, and then be granted uh, uh, cert? Well, the, the first part, I'm sure there, there must be. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, no, uh, I'm being facetious. They're normal people like the rest of us. Uh, they have uh, their particular uh, uh, enjoyments and pastimes and hobbies, um, um, and they like to pursue it. They work extremely hard to a person. Uh, whatever you think of anyone's particular judicial philosophy or, or anything, uh, the, these nine justices, I'm sure, work harder than their predecessors ever have. Um, and it is a... Uh, extremely difficult job that they have. Yes, a lot of their cases are a particular provision of the tax code and they want to get it right. But they also decide, uh, you know, in death penalty cases, who lives and who dies. Uh, the fundamental issues that tear at our social fabric, like the abortion controversy, affirmative action, uh, those fundamental cases. And uh, they are bound together. Yes, you do get little sniping here and there and opinions from time to time, but they're bound together by the knowledge that they share uh, this obligation uh, to confront these issues and to decide. Uh, they can't just sit at the end of the day like the rest of us can and say, oh, there are good arguments here, there are good arguments here, and debate it. They're going to actually decide it, and things are going to happen based on how they decide. And they know what each other goes through in struggling with those issues. Uh, it binds them together, I think, in a very firm bond, one that has symbolic expression. Uh, the tradition is before they assume the bench, they each shake hands with uh, one another. Before the start of a conference, they'll shake hands with one another. Um, they work hard. Uh, they're engaged in extremely serious and important business. but. You know, yes, they're normal individuals like the rest of us and have their, their enjoyments and pastimes and families and friends that they hope to be able to spend a little bit of time with. That's one reason I think it, you know, the notion of them leaving for the summer, of course, for the three months of the summer, they, their work continues. The several hundred cert petitions come in every week, and they get the hundreds of memos every week, and they get the briefs that they've got to prepare. Uh, but I think it's very important for them uh, to have that time to sort of say, you know, this term is over and recharge a little bit uh, uh, from the um, uh, emotional strain and re-gear for, for a new term. Oh, yeah, on the second part of your question. Oh, yes, uh, the court does take uh, IFP, informal pauperous cases, uh, from people. They will often assign counsel to argue their cases uh, before the Supreme Court. Uh, you don't have to be able to afford to print it up like this, if you uh, don't have the money, you can send it in however you can, and those cases are granted. Um, you, s you see them all the time. They're easy to tell because they have a big number. The paid cases start at one and go on up. The IFP cases, I think, start at 5,000 and go on up. And, you know, a significant percentage of the court's cases will be those IFP cases. Yes? What would be the difference between the proceedings that someone would see 
um, between oral arguments in, say, the state of Maine Supreme Court and in the United States Supreme Court? Are there any significant procedural differences? Well, I think there are. Uh, in, in an argument before the Maine Supreme Court, you're going to, for example, hear a lot of discussion about this U.S. Supreme Court case, assuming it's on a question of federal law or something, says this, and you, the Maine Supreme Court, have to follow that. You don't have a choice. In the U.S. Supreme Court, they don't have to follow anything. Uh, there's precedent, and they want to follow it, and they normally will, but if they disagree with it, they're free to disregard it or limit it. So the arguments in the U.S. Supreme Court tend to focus more on uh, basic principles, consequences, uh, logic as opposed to here's a case that you've got to follow, you're stuck with it, and it means I win, which is what you will often get in a, in a, a state Supreme Court or a lower federal court. Yes? Um, back in the 80s, there was talk that uh, Justice Marshall basically just hung on for as long as possible, that he, he did not want to be replaced by a Republican president. Um, I guess my question is, do you think that that there should be some sort of a, a, a method in place to prevent that sort of thing from happening? Is, is that a positive thing as you see it? Or? Well, I mean, they're, they're, uh, I don't, it's hard to imagine what method would be in place to prevent that from happening um, uh, throughout history. And it, it cer certainly was not the, the, the case in Justice Marshall's case, but throughout history there have been situations where justices have basically sort of hung on too long for whatever reason, whether it's who, who's going to replace them or, or you know, it's, 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 it's tough to recognize that it's time, time to go. And there have been stories throughout history of other justices going to a justice and saying, you know, it's, it's time for you to leave and, and, <laughs> and, uh, and it being a very sad duty for them to, them to perform. Um, but I don't think it's ever really affected the functioning of the of the court in a in a bad way, and I'd, I'd be very reluctant to replace it with any system where an outside force can come in and say, uh, you know, this justice should go because you're always concerned that it's going to be because of the opinions uh, and decisions rather than uh, age or whatever. On the other hand, it may be. I mean, the justices are tend to serve a long time now, and. You know, back in the 1787, life tenure meant a lot, usually a lot shorter time than it does now. Uh, and, you know, it, it doesn't strike me as beyond the pale to say that maybe the system ought to be, you know, you serve 15 or 20 years and then can't be reappointed because you don't want a situation where people be worried about what effect their decisions would have. Um, I don't know. I, I've seen that proposal, but uh, I don't know that it would be any better than now where you have uh, your own sense of, of when you're not, uh, you know, hitting the curveball anymore, as we say in baseball, and, and of course the ultimate uh, sanction of mortality that uh, uh, certainly removes you. Yes? Is there any transcript kept of the oral argument? You know, you've got your green, yellow, whatever it is, but is there a pink form for oral arguments? or that, Say you prepared sure, your two minutes or your 30 minutes, do you get to give them a copy of that as well? Oh, no, no. Uh, oral argument is oral, and uh, uh, people always bring to the podium with them uh, notes, notebooks, things they're going to look at, uh, almost never have a chance to do that. I mean, if you have your argument written down and don't know it well enough, the time it takes you to sort of pause and look and see what you're going to say, three different justices have asked you a question. Uh, so, uh, no, the, 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 the written part is pretty much with rare exceptions over when you're there. The justices want to engage in a dialogue, um, and that's, that's not uh, facilitated by having more writing involved. Yes? Yeah. When you engage in this dialogue, if, if the justice asks you a question, uh, do you uh, look, look at them or do you look at the whole bench? Oh, it, it depends. Uh, you obviously look at the one who's asking you uh, a question, but it's often the case, for example, that the one who's asking you a question uh, you don't think is going to be on your side. Uh, and he may be asking you a question in a particular area that you don't like, and you'd like to move it to some other. So what some advocates do is if you know, you're know you asking a question and it's not a good one and my answer is not a good one, I'll start by looking at you, but then turn to somebody else to try to move physically move the discussion 
in another direction. I mean, that's uh, true in any level of uh, oral advocacy. Um, and uh, on, on this court in particular, you have to uh, be careful. Uh, you know, a, a Justice Ginsburg, a Justice Scalia, uh, the Chief Justice, they, they can, they'll take your 30 minutes alone uh, with one question after another. So if we're here and you're Justice Ginsburg and I'm answering your questions and I don't turn and engage the other justices, you, we lose them. And, you know, maybe I lose that case eight to one. I get Justice Ginsburg's vote. Uh, so you do have to remember that, well, it's, it's uh, the late uh, Solicitor General Rex Lee uh, said the most important skill in Supreme Court advocacy uh, was mathematical. I mean, you always had to be able to count to five. Uh, so you need to engage at least, at least five of them. Yes? In your job as Deputy Solicitor General, did you, or did the Solicitor General, um, have any more sway with the court than anyone else would in in that role? I mean, did that accord any special privilege being a solicitor general for the United States? No, it, it accorded the special privilege that you got the chance to get up there a lot more often uh, than other lawyers. Um, uh, but certainly your arguments carried no more weight because you were the Solicitor General than the same arguments would from someone else. But they've been referred to as a tenth justice in some things I've read before. Is that, uh, is there any, yeah, no uh, merit to that at all? A, a fellow, uh, yeah, Lincoln Kaplan wrote a book called uh, uh, The Tenth Justice, which was actually about, uh, uh, as you say, the influence of the Solicitor General. So I, I read it and didn't agree with it at all. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, nine justices is quite enough. Uh, they don't, you don't need a tenth. Uh, and uh, 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 the Solicitor General's positions and arguments have a lot of weight and are taken seriously because they're the arguments of the United States, uh, because they uh, reflect an institutional experience and are carefully thought out. Um, and it means more if the government of the United States comes in and tells you if you decide this case this way, so many billions of dollars of tax revenue are going to be lost. Or we think this will have dramatic implications for our international relations. You know, if I go up and say that, they may or may not believe it, but uh, if the representative of the United States says it, it carries uh, some weight. But if the legal arguments aren't right, they're not going to be accepted just because they come. The, the one I didn't bring, the government's uh, briefs are all gray. They have a gray cover no matter whether it's petitioners, respondents, replying, they're all gray. But just because the arguments are in a gray brief, they're not going to be accepted uh, when they wouldn't be otherwise.